Janelle. Hello, Abram. Hello. <laughs> so, um, we were speaking to you from Harlem, from my bedroom in Harlem, and from Abram, Abram's shed in his backyard in East Harlem. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. And it's a windy day, so we might hear a little wind. Okay. We are, we're making it, <laughs> making it work. Okay, sounds good. All right, but, uh, I'll start us off. So, welcome to the Radical Bureaucrat, a podcast for people who want to change institutions from the inside. All right. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, Uh, it's great to have you, Janelle. Um, Today's Thursday, April 2nd, and in the past months, all sense of normalcy has been pretty much lost. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. You already know that. Um, uh, So today, we wanted to talk to someone who we think can help ground us in a sense of purpose and who can give us a sense of what we should be preparing for in terms of what comes next. We're heading across the country to speak with Dr. Janelle Scott, a professor at the University of uh, California at Berkeley. So she's at Cal Berkeley at the Graduate School of Education and African Americans in the African American Studies Department. Uh, Dr. Scott's research explores the relationship between education, policy, and equality of opportunities, and centers on three related policy strands, uh, the radical politics of public education, Racial politics. I'm sorry. The racial politics of public education, the politics of school choice, marketization, and privatization, and the role of elite and community-based advocacy in shaping public education. I think I first heard of Dr. Scott's research because she is a Teach for America alum like myself who has conducted research into the organization and written trenchant critiques of its theory of change, which essentially posits that what is needed for school systems to achieve equity is better school leaders and bureaucrats rather than systemic transformation. Uh, so, and I, I should say, I agree with her. She has also written about the dismantling of the New Orleans school system in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, which I think may be uh, particularly relevant at this moment in time. So even though our mood is heavy here in New York, we are very excited to have her on the podcast. Welcome, Janelle. Well, thank you. Thanks again for inviting me. Looking forward to our conversation. Great. Yeah, so how are you doing? How are things in San Francisco? Um, Well, I am speaking to you from Oakland, where I live. Um, And I should um, say the Bay Area. Sorry, I should be more specific. (laughs) The Bay Area, right. You know, it's a very, it's a, just like in New York, people are very committed to their region. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I mean, things are quiet in many ways as we, you know, try to honor the shelter in place directives um, by our policymakers and so staying pretty close to home and neighborhood. Um, and, you know, the, the encouraging news is that it seems to be working in terms of flattening our curve here, Um, but, uh, you know, all the schools are out, uh, um, higher ed and K-12, and so for those of us trying to, uh, working parents, obviously, that creates some challenges, um, particular challenges, uh, Mm -hmm. and not, you know, let alone the challenges for kids who are missing their routines and missing um, the day-to-day interactions of schooling. Yeah. For sure. Uh, Abram and I are both parents, so we can relate to that. Um, what's, so So you're alluding to a challenge here, but, but we wanted to start this by talking about how things are going for you. So what what is one challenge you're facing today, um, right now, that's, that's, that's present in your mind as an individual? It could be in your life or in your work, but, but what's coming up? Um, I think a challenge is trying to honor what was important pre-pandemic, um, mm. but also trying to gain some perspective about which of those things that were important uh, remains important in light mm-hmm. of the pandemic, mm-hmm. and trying to figure out how to kind of hold that mindset, right, that much of our work is important and needs to continue, and perhaps much of it isn't as important right now, <laughs> and um, and needing to make some judgments about that, um, mm. in a, you know, in a field like education where there is just so much persistent need, having to decide something's not as important feels odd. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and you know, wanting to ensure my own children are um, are okay, um, mm-hmm. 
you know, I um, because I think of the privilege we enjoy in terms of having, you know, um, educational backgrounds and um, kids who are neurotypical, I'm not as worried about their um, learning. I think we'll be able to make it up, but I do worry about the social and emotional trauma and loss that they're experiencing in terms mm-hmm. of seeing their friends and their social networks and their teachers and um, and family. And so that's also just sort of constant on my mind as I'm trying to attend to my own students and, um, you know, wanting to make sure I'm not neglecting my children. Mm. Uh, and just being, again, deeply mindful of the privilege I hold and be able, in being able to even think about that. Um, I don't have to leave home to work and um, you know, I'm not working in a, a grocery store and away from my family, and I know that that's a really specific, particular kind of privilege. Um, but that's what's on my mind um, because it's sort of what's closest to home, literally, yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think you're really getting right at so many of the, like your. The way that you're describing the situation is exactly why we wanted to talk to you because um, you're really kind of crystallizing some of these thoughts that, that we've been grappling with. Um, and I'm wondering if you could expand on the first part. Mm-hmm. Just and, and, and I've seen this a little bit in your Twitter thread, just mm-hmm. where you're grappling with um, what is important right now as mm-hmm. opposed to before. And, and also, um, because part of what's happening now is that all the inequities that existed before are being magnified. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's really illustrating for us what is most important and, and where the, the, the real root issues are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing that's happening is it is forcing us to think about what's really important. Mm-hmm. You know, our kids are the most important thing to us. And so, you know, right now in a crisis, we, we want to be present for our children. Um, and so these are these are tensions that are definitely coming up for us as well. So, mm-hmm. but but in terms of that prioritizing, like how is that? What, where have you had to figure out what was important before may not be as important now? Can you give us an example? Uh, well, I mean, I think a sort of big example is um, the American Educational Research Association uh, holds its annual meeting every April. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and I'm uh, part of the currently part of the leadership of the association. Um, you know, regard that work is very important. I value it. I hold it dear. <laughs> um, but you know, along with um, the AERA council, we made the decision um, several weeks ago to cancel the physical meeting and in lieu of a virtual one. And um, and then, as things unfolded around the country and the world, um, you know, with all credit due to, to the, the leadership of the association, we revisited that decision and decided to not even hold a virtual meeting, um, mm-hmm. which doesn't mean the research isn't important um, anymore, but presenting the research and engaging in that kind of scholarly conversation in that format just didn't seem as important as people's well-being. Um, and so recognizing that even though people care about scholarship and, and think that evidence matters for thinking about schools and, um, schooling systems, um, having to, um, make the decision and support the decision to let that go for now, um, is one, um, I think pretty good example, at least in, you know, in my, in, in, in higher education. Um, and I'm, you know, I've, our decision was unanimous as a council, and I'm, um, but I'm also very proud of how those deliberations unfolded, and a lot of it had to do with thinking about what is the educative role right now, right? What is the model that we can set for when it's time to set some things aside and focus on um, very important immediate mm. um, issues around mental health, physical safety, right. health and well-being a family, um, and to think about that as a way to model for our field, um, which I, you know, although I'm sitting from the standpoint in higher ed, I consider my field to be, um, you know, from early childhood (laughs) to K-12 to higher ed, that as a field we can do this, right? We can show our students and our colleagues that we know um, that what's most essential 
is the thing to focus on right now. So um, I don't mean to get too highfalutin about that <laughs> decision, but I do think it's not insignificant, and I think it is set, you know, sort of a standard for other associations to also think about that kind of work that maybe not gathering right now is um, even virtually is the most supportive and sustainable uh, choice. Um, mm. Um, so I think that's one um, sure. major example. Sure. Yeah, we've talked with a, a few different people on the podcast, both in higher ed and in K-12, through who have expressed some, if not frustrations, at least some pr- pretty strong questionings of, mm-hmm. are we just replicating everything we were done before, we were doing before, and why? Like, do, mm-hmm. do we have to you know, do we have to do this work the same way or at all? Um, And and I think about some of the work that you've done studying uh, the situation in New Orleans post-Katrina, which Sam mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, nobody can predict exactly how things will pan out, but it does feel like this is a bigger crisis than anything that I read from the historical record. And so, therefore, the ways in which the system will be reshaped you know, will be mm-hmm. profound, and and mm-hmm. you know, what are those? What are some of those things? Do you think within the field of education, either you know across that whole spectrum that, that you're interested in? What are some things you saw from from mm-hmm. the aftermath of Katrina that we should be vigilant for, uh, sure. or what are some things that we should be you know hopeful about having seen you know innovation pop up after difficult circumstances? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think. As you know, the evidence and around what happened and what the effects have been about what happened uh, in New Orleans in terms of essentially becoming an all school choice charterized school district. Um, that evidence, I think, is decidedly contested still. I think right. what, what's not um, as deeply contested is the fact that these changes happened and that you know that that there were advocates. Um, who were ready with a plan to make that happen, even as families were still discovering that their loved ones had died in the um, storm and the um, subsequent flooding. Um, mm. And so I think I think one of our biggest challenges um, in this moment, beyond these, you know, very important and you know, probably for the foreseeable future, long term um, issues of, of health and well being, um, is I think a, a a really important um, imperative that we think about why why public education what is it why does it matter for a democratic society um, what are its limitations um, that have been built into the structure and the dynamics of it how can those be um, addressed um, because I think what I worry about is um, predates our pandemic right Mm -hmm. um what i worry about has been um a kind of diminished public discourse around the role of public schools Mm. in our society this notion that anything related to government or public is bad or Mm -hmm. inefficient or dysfunctional um and so you know given that most schooling systems public schooling systems were not ready right to move um from having children in buildings to remote learning, remote access, I worry that some of the things I'm hearing in in probably flippant ways is like, well, you know, why did we even need schools in the first place, right? If we can do this all remotely, um, maybe there's a part that we never come back to, right? Um, And I do think the impulse for reimagination can be very productive, but I worry that the impulse right now for reimagination is toward diminishing the public sphere. And I think we have to be attentive to that in light of what happened in New Orleans um, around questions of democratic governance um, and, um, you know, citizen control over the schools. And so um, I don't say that to romanticize what existed in New Orleans pre-Katrina anymore than I say that to romanticize what existed in our public schools pre-pandemic. Um, but I do think we need to find a language that honors what was good and important um, before crisis. Um, otherwise, I do worry that we'll lose it post-crisis. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more. I, I kind of feel like the, maybe one of the ways in which this is different is how there's a kind of widespread pattern that we've never had before, which is that everyone has been forced all of a sudden to self-manage their children's education with no warning or preparation. And some places were a little more well positioned to make that move. Um, you know, I, I've I've talked a little bit uh, on Twitter about Harvard as like a very early signal that everybody followed. If Harvard can close down, the rest of us can close down. But that that was done without thinking about, you know, the fact that some kids rely on Harvard for housing and food. And so what do you do with those okay. students? Um, okay. And so. You know, I wonder if you're noticing things even as we're going through the crisis that that kind of fit in to, to this idea. You know, for you know, one thing that I've noticed is is people expressing a lot of kind of awe and gratitude for the amount of work that people who work at schools are doing every day. Right. Like like right. it really is a lot of work to to work with all these children. But besides that, I wonder what are some things that we are learning as we go through this together? Um, I, I mean, I think that's a big one, and, you know, I do hope that people, um, you know, when this is all over, and may it be all over one day, um, I hope people are able to hold on to that appreciation. Yeah, I um, agree. Yeah. One, right? yeah. Um, so there's that. I mean, I think, you know, my mind goes in a number of directions as you, as you uh, talk about some of these dimensions. I, you know, I, I, um, I know there was something published this week, I can't recall exactly where, um, in this information overload <laughs> time mm -hmm. um, that was essentially saying let's cancel summer and have kids go to school during the summer this year, like all bets are off mm -hmm. in the summer. And, and I'm, I was sympathetic with the argument in some ways because I think in part the argument was coming from a place of wanting to ensure that children who don't have um, the luxury of having parents at home who are even trying to manage it all, right? Mm -hmm. Parents who have to leave home to go to work, but also kids who are in foster care, kids who are homeless, right? Mm -hmm. All of these communities um, that this uh, argument, I think, was trying to recognize, right? Who is particularly harmed in this time of parental management. But it also struck me that the author was essentially arguing for a massive reorganization of the workforce, right? The teacher workforce, which as we know mm -hmm. is roughly 80% women. And without any acknowledgement of the kind of gender mm -hmm. <laughs> dynamics mm -hmm. of calling for um, this largely female profession to, uh, to go to work. Um, for which they are not compensated, right? So um, I think there, there's also a way in which the appreciation is being expressed, but we haven't really thought about, yeah, like let's talk about a major um, examination of state funding systems so that teacher salaries are on par um, with not only uh, the academic preparation um, it takes to become a teacher, um, but also in terms of the incredible cost of living issues that so many teachers are struggling with around the country. And so I hope we don't just, you know, when we are able to come back together, students, families, teachers, and schools, that it's a lot of sort of flowers and, you know, baked goods, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right? That, you know, that what would it mean to actually honor this as a profession um, that is truly a profession um, that people don't enter into necessarily as um, just a fallback because they couldn't do anything else, but that there's real expertise and wisdom, professional wisdom there that deserves to be compensated and supported um, through robust public structures, right? Like, that's the conversation I hope we are yeah. going to end up in um, with all these, I think, very sincere expressions of gratitude and appreciation um, as people struggle to bounce uh, educating their kids um, at home, those who are able to do that. Um, yeah. And anyway, um, that's not even to touch on the issue of um, student disability and, and neuroatypical students and how um, just they're really, uh, we really are, I think, at a, um, just not at a grid. <laughs> we, we are not set up, right, for yeah, uh, I mean, how remote learning will meet their needs. It's, know? I struggle a little bit. Um, you know, Sam and I have a common friend who, who, who kind of denounces the idea that money will fix schools because we're just plowing money into an existing biased, you know, uh, patriarchal, racist, heteronormative, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, system. 
and you know we okay. we can plow more resources into that system and if okay. if we're concerned about this these students in foster care which i i was a student in foster care i was in foster care as a, okay. as a student okay. um I think we have to also talk about what the outcomes we're getting for those students are because the current yes. system, okay. the current setup isn't serving them great. Um, you know, we're doing the best we can with limited resources. I get it. But, you know, I think there's a lot of things that, that, you know, we also have to put up on that table when we really talk about re re-architecting you know the system of how we develop the future talent of the human race essentially yeah no i mean i, I i'm i'm glad to um put forward that provocation because i think that's that's a really important um reminder you know as i was saying i think it's really critical to not romanticize <laughs> um, um even as we um appreciate the hard work of, of teachers and, and leaders and school staff um that you know that that the conditions under which many um, children are educated are deplorable, right? They're not um, they're not in by any means satisfactory. I mean, you know, one issue that I think um, related issue in terms of what we've been talking about that comes to mind is just you know not only has this crisis um, made clear about all you know, the sort of parental uh, inequity, but also, you know, the school by school inequity um, mm -hmm. that yeah. we've all known has been there, right? But, um, you know, I think a lot about right. where, if you know, for foster youth, you know, where they're concentrated. Um, mm -hmm. It's not as if we, you know, mm -hmm. all schools are experiencing having to uh, think about how to serve kids. Um, or are in foster care or um, whose families are homeless, that we see a concentration of many of those dynamics in particular schools. And, you know, even though I know districts are starting to develop learning plans that are district-wide, I think what we know is that local still really matters, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in Oakland, the Oakland Unified School District has, you know, a district learning plan with resources. But, you know, we're not paying much attention to that. We're paying attention to what the kid's school is putting out right and mm -hmm. um and so if you're in a school with deep concentrated poverty um and you know many of the other issues that we've been talking about that even further disadvantages you and so i hope that we revitalize this conversation that it's not just simply about resources and i don't think anyone who really studies resource inequality would ever um seriously argue that but um but to really think specifically about what resources look like, how they're played out, that resources mm -hmm. are not just, um, um, you know, sort of the, the proverbial throwing money at schools, although right. Jonathan Kogel, yeah. um, I think, nicely argues that we've never thrown money at schools. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair, right? that's a fair point. <laughs> um, but that, it, you know, it sort of matters what the need is in a school mm -hmm. um, right. in terms of being able to fully serve um, students and communities. Um you know, the fact that we had to think about schools being um, food pantries for so many families is a really important thing to make visible that I don't think, I was just talking to a friend who's, you know, brilliant um, researcher who said they had no idea that there were so many um, homeless and hungry kids in New York City. Like, this yeah. is not part, right, just not part of their consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, my hope is that we don't lose, I think, a developing consciousness about these very important um, community-centric roles that schools are playing and what kind of resources they would need to actually be able to do that um, in a way that met um, more fully um, the challenges that our families are experiencing. And as you know, these unemployment numbers, um, which are just dire and stark and um, um, continue to, to grow, um, you know, these are parents, right? These are parents with children who um, are now living under, you know, incredible stress and trauma. And so these conditions are only going to heighten um, under this crisis. And I think we really have to think hard about what kinds of schools these kids are going to, um, our kids are going to be going back to um, in yeah. terms of what they're going to be able to provide. Yeah. I feel, and my, my fear is that, <laughs> One of the things, one of my many fears, is that when this is over, it's going to be like um, coming out after a blizzard, and when the mm. snow melts, 
and all the things that that we're not seeing right now because people, you know, the the most vulnerable among us are have are are going to be the most isolated right now, mm-hmm. and we're going to see the real cost. And on the flip side, I I have this hope that people are appreciating what their public institutions can do for them, mm-hmm. and and even if they didn't do a great job before, they'll, they'll recognize where they either are or are not filling a gap and, and where they need to. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, we'll experience something like the, uh, after the Great Depression with, the, mm-hmm. you know, the alphabet soup of government programs mm-hmm. and, and the development of things that are still in place today. Um, I'm also just reminded, I, I'm, keep thinking about two things that came up as you guys were talking. One is that New York City already, I don't know if you saw, uh, basically canceled spring break. Um, the, the union came out and, and announced it, but the, we're still waiting to hear what exactly that'll mean. It's not going to be mm-hmm. exactly business as usual. And then I'm also reminded of, um, what was Arnie Duncan's famous quote after Katrina? Did he say it was the best thing that ever happened to the school system did, there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's the throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to avoid that notion that there was nothing good here before. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we want to recognize where where things were working well, um, but also where the gaps are. And the gaps are becoming so apparent. And it's it's striking to me, just the remote learning thing in New York City, there's so much... In the in the in the school system, people are becoming very aware of which schools seem to be moving into it rather seamlessly, mm-hmm. and which schools are not. And it's part of it is that the more affluent schools definitely have the resources and and are moving in really a lot more easily. But even among the other schools, uh, you see a difference a difference in pedagogy, a difference in resources. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Sorry, that was a bit rambly, but a, a lot oh, no. of thoughts were coming up with for me while I was while I was listening. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I do think that there are um, competing visions, right, for what an excellent, equitable system of public education should look like, and those competing visions existed before this. They existed before Katrina they will exist after. I think the difference is who will be best positioned to realize those visions. Um, and um, and so I do think that um, a challenge is everyone is pulled into worrying about their well-being, their family's well-being, you know, as, as you sort of ripple out into your um, connected communities is what role educators will play in shaping the vision for uh, public education um, and uh, because you know there are other visions out there that are much more aligned to a New Orleans model, a marketized model right, a sort of virtual remote learning model or some sort of hybridized um, learning model and some you know some of those have some you know important positive as- attributes um, and some of them don't and I think um, you know being able to distinguish and delineate between them is going to require um, the participation of, of educators and people who know schools and know mm-hmm. classrooms and know communities. And um, and so I think the, the, the you know, incredible uh, challenge will be how to um, sort of marshal um, and organize those, um, those visions for public education at a time when teachers are feeling the most constrained and most, um, you know, unable to do the kind of planning um, and organizing um, that might lead to um, some concrete um, plans for reimagining and revitalizing schooling. And so, um, you know, I think what we're, you know, I hear from my own friends who are parents and, 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 um, you know, in the public discourse is, again, thinking about all these other functions of schools that people forgot that mattered, let alone, right, what we've talked about already in terms of teachers, but the social function in terms of kids being with other children, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. the sort of um, civic purpose of school, right? right? Mm -hmm. Um, And, um, you know, and then perhaps, you know, it's hard to provide a hierarchy of what's most important when everything feels so critical right now. But I think, you know, teaching 
uh, children and young adults to be critical consumers of evidence. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, you know, like what we are seeing um, play out, um, right. uh, you know, uh, with our national leadership in terms of just denying scientific evidence um, and the sort of politic- politicization of evidence, um, you know, that we are going to need a generation that is able um, to... Yeah. Uh, to, to think about evidence and weigh alternative forms of evidence, and so, and how schools are so central uh, to to all of that, and you know the extent to which one can do that through digital platforms, um, I think really needs some scrutiny. Yeah. Oh yes, I hope so. <laughs> um, well, we we're we're just about at time, and we always want to end by asking our guests, uh, what's keeping you calm in the midst of this storm? Um, well, you know, I, I am appreciating, um, in the shelter in place, we are allowed to exercise. So mm-hmm. be mindful of getting out for walks with the dog and um, listening to podcasts, um, is, has been a really, um, well, I don't know about calm because sometimes the podcasts, um, are no. <laughs> <laughs> depends on the podcast, well, <laughs> but you know, it does allow for a kind of different having your mind and body work together in a different way. Um, and then, you know, our family has been able to slow down a little bit and um, we've been doing puzzles. And so mm-hmm. getting mm-hmm. everyone together um, at night after we, the work and school days are over and, um, you know, trying to solve a puzzle together is, is wonderful. So um, That's a great one. How old are you kids? 11 and 13. Yes, that's perfect. All right, well, thank you so much, Janelle. It was great to meet you, and uh, we really enjoyed this conversation. Got yeah, a lot out of it. It's great to meet thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Great to meet you, Janelle. Okay, Stay safe. Care. Okay, you too. So, Abram, uh, let's end like good radicals. What is one thing you learned today that you can use to create a more just and equitable world? Um... Yeah, that was that was a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I think that um, just having an appreciation for the profound interconnectedness of these issues, you know, and there and there are issues that we left off the table. We didn't talk about at all. Um, But, Mm -hmm. you know, thinking about just the different needs of parents, you know, teachers, school leaders, system leaders. Um, and how all of that is being shut down and re rejiggered, um, you know, so where can we question, um, where to use which kind of tool or setting, you know, more effectively. Um, but you know, that that's connected in ways that are, um, really, you know what, Abram, I think Janelle's calling me back. Let me see if I can pass you through. Sure. Hold on. Janelle, are you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. I think I hung up on you. You're back. Oh no! Welcome no, back. We we we, uh, we we only do one take on the podcast, okay. so yeah. this is all we're doing. Okay. And uh, what we do is after did you hang up, we uh, we keep talking for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Did you think of something that you wanted to share? You forgot to plug your book or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, not at all. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Take care. Bye. Take care. Uh, so yeah, that, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> that was kind of awesome. I don't know. What, should we leave that in? I don't know. Um, so, the interconnectedness of things. So, you know that ha- housing, right, and and food security, right. So food and shelter, the bottom of the Maslow pyramid stuff, right. Um, mm-hmm. That that human stuff. The need for social affirmation, the need for some kind of achievement or success, right? Like, uh, you know, these are all needs that are, you know, kind of quietly and with and in and in varied 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 levels of success, uh, needs that are served in schools, right? And then suddenly, you know, you're locked in. Um, everybody goes home, the schools are closed, except for bare minimum essential kind of services. Um, 
and you start to really question, you know? I mean, if we get a lot out of spending time outside and solving puzzles, maybe we should do more of that. Um, you know? I don't know. A lot yeah. of thought. A lot of different thoughts well, that, triggered. That gets, but I feel like there's a lot yeah. of connections. I mean, that that kind of gets at what she said is the biggest challenge for this moment, which was a challenge before, which is why public education? Are we having this conversation mm-hmm. about why it matters? What are its limitations? What are what's its potential? So, because if you know, we are now realizing what's most important and how it relates to public education. How are we going to have the conversation about what public education should look like in the future? Mm-hmm. And and I do think that a question, there's an immediate question for this moment, which is, it, this is I guess this is the same two questions that we always face. Like we, you, you told the parable of, of the babies floating down the river on one of our mm-hmm. earlier podcasts, right? The, the, you know, and our job is the babies floating down the river. You got to save every baby. Every baby matters, but you also want to know where the baby's coming from. Why are they floating down the river? And so we have to have this two, two, uh, these whole two thoughts in, in our brain at the same time. Mm-hmm. What are we doing right now to, to, meet the immediate yeah. needs. To prevent but, harm. But where are we to, have, to prevent harm, but where are we going to have the conversation about the oh, root causes? Yeah, about the and root about causes, yeah. What the, and, and what the real opportunities are here. And I do think that because there's a crisis, there is going to be an opportunity, and I just hope that we can recognize it and seize it yeah. to rethink what we're doing. Well, what I heard... And, What I heard from her early in the call was that people already had a plan when before the crisis struck. So so Mm -hmm. where are the plans that have already emerged that we can rally around? Yeah, that's right. All right. So uh, we should also end by being good bureaucrats. I could go on for hours, but we should end at some point. Uh, okay. The views expressed here are our personal opinions and do not reflect the official or unofficial position of any government, agency, policy, party, leader, or really anyone besides the two of us, and maybe you, but maybe not. This content has not been sponsored or approved by anyone and was mostly just made because we wanted an opportunity to talk about things that matter to everyone, whether they realize it or not. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everybody.